Right, good evening everybody. Um, for, those who, for those of you who don't know me, this is not my first rodeo, although admittedly with Crossim it was under a different name previously. I think it's probably what, my seventh session for you guys? Yeah, and you, were, you, were, you did the first ever yes, one as well. Yes, uh, so. I, I have the credentials of being the first ever presenter that they had on. In this building just across the road, behind here, you were in fact. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. What was that? Carriel Square. Carriel House, ten, 10 years ago, something like that? No, less than that. Man. Less than Six, that? January, January 2018. Oh, fuck yeah. it. So it's maybe I'm that. maybe I'm thinking I'm older than I actually <laughs> am. Anyway, I am a local northern idiot, sorry, developer. I'm a, I'm a Geordie developer. I uh, go by the, answer, by the name of Shorty. I am clinically deaf. These things are turned up full, but things like the heating system and what have you can drown me out. So if I don't hear you yet and you pose a question, just try jumping around like an idiot. I'll see you eventually. Um, if you want to come and stalk me on the interwebs, you can email me there. You can find me on Twitter there. Or come and find Lidnug. It's the, lo the global.net users group that I help run on the LinkedIn platform. We've been around for something like a good 12 or 13 years now and we were doing online live sessions when everybody didn't even know what they were. Um, we don't do any these days, I come out and I do things people like Kasim, but on YouTube we have a hell of a library including a lot of interviews <laughs> with the likes of um, Scott Redshirt um, from Microsoft before he became a vice president. I can never remember his second name. Yeah, anyway. I haven't got any code up for this session yet. If I put any up, it'll be on my GitHub page. But the code that you're going to see tonight is going to come directly from the .NET Nano repository. So you'll find it there. This is the exact source, the basic Azure SDK one that I'm going to uh, walk you through. What am I going to do? Right, we are going to take a look at getting .NET Nano and we're going to put .NET Nano on this thing. This is a stock ESP32. Nothing magic about it. If you look closely online, you can pick these things up in packs of three for about £10 on Amazon um, from a lot of the Chinese and German electronics manufacturers. I'm going to go through a few slides and um, just to give you a quick overview of what we're going to be discussing. But then mostly, once I'm done with the slides, it's going to be straight into Azure. I'm going to go through and walk you through the code base of the sample that I've got with me. Now, before we start, how many of you here are doing any kind of IoT projects? Just two. Done them before. Done them before, but you're not currently working on them, okay? And I'm assuming you're all pretty au fait with Azure, because I was watching the, uh, the hands going up in Dan's session. Now, thankfully, Dan's also done me a bit of a service, because some of the things that he's shown you, such as things like application insights and logging and things like that, it means that I don't have to go into that in any detail. Okay, so what's .NET Nano? Well, my subtitle gives it away. Basically, it's your favorite, favorite language, but for tiny things. I assume we all do C Sharp in here. Yes? Yeah. Pretty much the majority of us. Well, you may or may not know of a platform known as Meadow IoT. Yes, does that ring any bells with anybody? No? Meadow IoT was probably one of the first attempts at getting C Sharp as a first class language onto small devices. The problem was with Meadow IT, they had to create it in such a way as it would only go on specific devices that they specified and they provide. So if you subscribe into the Meadow IoT subsystem, you have to buy a Meadow IT board. You have to go with one of their recommended platforms, 
with and the required amount of memory, processor, that kind of thing. .NET Nano, on the other hand, is built from the open source C Sharp sources. So we all know that in this day and age, .NET Core onwards is all open source now. The guys that have done .NET Nano, Nano sorry, have taken this open source code base, they've boiled it down into its lowest common denominator, and they have made different build systems and different platforms to allow the very same runtime that you are all using to create desktop applications, ASP.NET applications, and everything else, but run them on these. And not specific models like the Meadow IoT subsystem, but on general models that you can just go out tomorrow and buy off places like Amazon. Now, that said, it won't run on everything. Particularly Arduino. All of you out there that are thinking, oh great, I can dig my Arduino, the small one, the Arduino Mega and... Yes, that one. <laughs> the smaller devices, all of those you were thinking, I can dig those out of my drawer and start putting .NET on them. Uh -uh. The system that you put it on has to have at least 64K of RAM and a 64K flash and a 32-bit processor. So essentially, if the board you are running on has something like an ARM Cortex M0, M1, M2, M3, M4 or similar, it's going to run it. If it's a, I think it's a transmitter that's on the ESP32, it's going to run it. If it's the new RISC-V systems, it's probably going to run it. So, basically, anything that's in the modern day being used is probably going to run it. Anything older than about two or three years, you're probably going to struggle. To get .NET Nano onto your device, you need to flash a firmware onto it. So, just like, just like you would flash, say, a MicroPython interpreter onto something, or um, your C Sharp runtime, or something like that onto it, the device needs to be flashed. You do that with a tool that's provided by the .NET Nano team called NanoFF, Nano Firmware Flasher. NanoFF is provided as a .NET tool. Come back to that in a second. Pretty much all the ESP32 devices are supported, including the newer ones, such as the ESP32C2, the C1. And ESP32 is a recommended device purely because of the fact that it has built-in Wi-Fi. Many of the others you have to have an Ethernet interface on and things start getting complicated at that point. Well in the ESP32, built in Wi-Fi, boom, bog, Bob's your uncle. The Nano Framework has first class support in it from the system.net namespace. And you can control and run with your Wi-Fi exactly the same way using the same API surface as you're going to use in system.net on a much larger PC. The only difference is, in most cases, it's going to be prefixed with Nano Framework. So instead of Microsoft.system.net, it'll be Nano Framework.system.net. STM32 blue pill boards are the exception to the rule. The STM32 has the right type of processor on it, but just a little bit too less memory. The actual RAM on a blue pill is 20k, and you need at least 64 on the RAM. They have enough flash, they just don't have enough RAM. And that's a crying shame because the blue pills you can literally pick up for 50 pence a quid, two quid maximum each. In the case that a board is not supported, then the community has an official repo on the .NET Nano Framework GitHub repository 
that supports different boards. Now, a lot of these community contributions that support different boards are built from well-known boards that are already in production. Um, things like the STM Discovery, for example, the official ST micro boards, practically every single one of them are supported officially. Raspberry Pi Pico support is in the works. Um, I should actually have checked before I came out today, but I didn't have time this morning, so I don't know that may actually have been released now. But suffice to say, the RP2040 is the latest device that's gaining support for .NET Nano, and it won't be very long before you're going to be able to do some absolutely mental things with that. Um, in case you're wondering particularly why I'm so excited about the Raspberry Pi Pico, the Raspberry Pi Pico has a new system on it that allows you to generate digital signals on any of its I.O. pins without involving the CPU that's on the board. Literally, it has sub-CPUs, and you can use it to generate things like VGA, graphics signals, HDMI, and all manner of things. So, we're getting into the territory here, once the RPI is released, with a device that's that size, being able to be programmed with C-sharp, that can produce output on a large screen HDMI TV. Now, I think that's something to get quite enthusiastic about. As I said before, .NET Nanoff is the tool that you want. By the way, if I step in front of the screen, you can't see, just shout at me. <laughs> um, .NET Nanoff is the tool that you want. Uh, .NET tool install dash g Nanoff, that will get you the flasher. .NET tool update g Nanoff if you already have it installed. Nanoff has a stupid amount of options, so please do use dash dash help. I apologise for PowerPoint, by the way. These are supposed to be double dashes. Yeah, PowerPoint's just trying to be helpful. In my case, I'm using the stock ESP32 tonight. So, in order to get Nanoff to flash my device, Nanoff platform ESP32, I'm connected via a serial port, com whatever the serial port number is, update. That will go and it will grab the latest nano firmware, it will suck it down over the internet. So you do usually have to have a live connection for this, but you're going to have to have a live connection to use IoT Hub anyway. And that will pull and put the latest version on your board. If you need a specific version or you need to rewind back in time, then the Nano team preserve, I think, it's about the last five or six released production versions. Anything beyond that, you can go and grab the sources, you can set a define, and you can build the source to the version that you need. If you need assistance, there's a Discord group. Everybody has a Discord group these days. I cannot remember off the top of my head what the actual link to it is. Um, I just go the Discord and it's there in my sidebar, no particular URL. But if you go to the official Nano Framework repository on GitHub, or the master page anyway, you will find that all the links you need are in there. There is excellent documentation for an open source project. I cannot stress this enough. The Nano Framework team have not only got developers, but they have actively recruited open source advocates to help them write the documentation. Like proper writers, not just software developers writing it. So the documentation is absolutely fantastic. There are articles that will answer most of your questions. They have a full Q&A section. They have sets of pages specific to things like the ESP2 family, the ESP, STM32 family, the Pico family, that kind of thing. Right, so that's .NET Nano. You'll get a demo of it in a moment. I'll actually show you how to flash the device. We'll go through a, a practical demonstration of it. But before then, any questions? 
Fantastic. That means I'm doing a great job. Right. As you write your tea hub, has anybody played with, had a look at, has any idea of what as you or your tea hub is, what it does? Yes? No? Okay, new information then. Well, again, my little subtitle gives it away. Do we know what MQTT is? Right. Okay, PubSub. Anybody familiar with PubSub system? Right. Fantastic. So, MQTT is PubSub for small devices. Well, it doesn't have to be small devices. It's actually a very lightweight PubSub protocol. You could use it between units, um, servers, different databases, anything that you want to transfer lightweight data between. You could use MQTT. But it made its start in the microelectronics industry as a means to send and receive command sets to and from devices and controlling applications. Now, MQTT is a bit weird. Um, I will give you the basic 100 foot overview. MQTT uses a concept called topics. So, on your MQTT server, you might create ESP32 slash home slash living room slash temperature. ESP32 slash home slash living room slash lights. And you can assign those topics to hold any kind of data you want. Structured JSON data, a simple value, a complex binary string encoded in B64. When a client connects to that server and it queries that topic, it will be given that piece of data. So, what you have is you have clients that create listeners, think events, we're all familiar with C-sharp events, yes? Think events, listening on a topic, then some master control program updating a value on a topic, and each of these things that are listening suddenly gets an event saying, this is updated, there's the new value. Okay? That's essentially how MQTT works. Um, in Microsoft's case, what they've done is they've taken this MQTT model and they are, and they are managing it for you. Okay? So, instead of you getting to create these topics that you're subscribing to and that you're writing values to, because remember, your device can control as well as listen, just as the program can control as well as listen. It's fully two-way. What Microsoft have done is they have wrapped up particular sets of topic structure into a nice, neat, managed system that runs across the Azure infrastructure. From within, in, from within Azure itself, you communicate with everything in much the same way as you communicate with anything else Azure, via HTTP, via the various SDKs that Microsoft provide for it. Um, they also use their own authentication system. So in the case of Azure IoT, you, when you create devices, when you create things to go into your IoT hub, you will also generate what's called a SAS key. And that SAS key is what gives your device access to IoT hub. And as you might expect, those SAS keys are as credentials, just as you would have a password or a username for a database access, um, key for an API, that kind of thing. Um, what, these, what the authentication system does is it combines the HTTP endpoint of your IoT hub and it combines the key and various other factors so that IoT Hub is 100% sure that the device that's connecting is the device that it expects to connect. The device with the SDK on, in this case running under .NET Nano, will then hook up to various events in the SDK provided by Microsoft and the various functionality that the Microsoft SDK provides, and it'll automatically latch itself onto these different topics 
in a way that means all you have to write is literally very simple event handlers. Okay, so MQTT has various different types. I'm oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. MQTT on Azure has hooks in to all the other elements in Azure as well. So if you are writing Azure functions, you can connect your telemetry or anything that your device is emitting across this MQTT connection directly into your backend infrastructure. You can send it to an Azure webhook, you can send it to a service bus queue, you can send it to blob storage. Heck, you could even send it straight into the machine learning and the AI stuff that Dan showed you earlier. It can support hundreds, if not thousands. In fact, I've seen a demo where I think there was roughly one and a half million devices attached to a single hub. So this thing scales from a handful of devices to a whole infrastructure of them. The client that I'm currently work with, who've been kind enough to let me use their Azure account to do this demo tonight, are planning to push out a UK global deployment of some new devices associated with electric vehicles. When that goes public, the next phase will be to put it globally. So we're talking about a company here that is going to rely on IoT Hub to push out two, three, four devices for everybody that owns an EV charger, en masse. That's the kind of deployments they're expecting to get. I've done timing and I have looked at the telemetry messages coming back from some of those devices into IoT webhooks and Azure functions and they have been sub one second. Even when something like 20, 30, 40, 50 devices are all transmitting in exactly the same time. So if you're going to do this with IoT Hub and you're going to connect it to your existing Azure infrastructure, you're going to have to make sure that what you write further down the chain can also scale. So we get the overall impression now. We understand what, what's happening here. We've got devices talking to the cloud, the cloud's acting as a mediator and passing it on up the chain to pretty much wherever the heck you want to. Everybody good with that? No questions? No? Great. So this two-way messaging that we get using MQTT has several different channels. Now as I go through these different channels, you may actually start thinking to yourself, well there's a bit of an overlap here. And I'll say up front that yes there is. You can look at the first set and look at the second set and there is a similar sort of data transfer, but the idea behind the way the different channels are used is they are designed to be used in different scenarios. The first off is what's more commonly known as telemetry. Now, telemetry to most of us is, I have a temperature sensor on the board, and every 10 seconds or so, it reports the temperature that it's running at. Something like that rapidly, well maybe not rapidly, but repeating messages of a similar type. Yeah? Now, that channel, the telemetry channel, is actually more commonly known as the device to cloud messaging channel. And the device to cloud running across MQTT can transfer anything that MQTT can. So if you wanted to say hello world to your device, you can put the string hello world in, you can go send it, and it'll send hello world. What your device then does with that is then tidy up to your device. Likewise, the other way, you can have your telemetry coming out from the device and you can intercept the message coming back. 
that can be JSON for a JSON payload. In it. But as you'll see in a minute when I do the demo, there's actually other ways to include JSON with that. But more importantly, if you are bringing across something that had a more binary format, let's say for example, and this was the case for one of my clients, they had an existing system running across the Thing network and their payloads were heavily binary. And we basically took that as is verbatim and whisked it across to Azure. No problems. And then in time, as things grew and as they further developed their platform, we changed that to JSON. Yeah? That was the device to cloud messaging. Very simple, very straightforward. The opposite of the telemetry stream, I got a little bit ahead of myself, but cloud to device is essentially the opposite of your telemetry channel. Um, so if you have back-end infrastructure, and they are core, they are methods and classes in the Microsoft Official SDKs to do all this. I'm going to show you it from the Azure platform, but everything I show you on the Azure platform, you can do from your own applications in C Sharp. Um, again, cloud to device message, messages back to the device. Say hello world, give us some metadata. It could be a command, stop, reboot, things like that. It's entirely up to you. Also, with cloud to device messaging and device to cloud messaging, they do not have to be responded to. They are fire and forget. So cloud to device, I can say device number one on network five, piece some information for you. And that's it. That's all I do. I don't sit around waiting for a result. I can if I want. I can program my device to say, I've received that, but I send a reply back. That's entirely up to me. There is no requirement for the device to be online. The reason I'm making a point of this is because, as you'll see in a minute, there is an alternate API that does use that kind of structure. Twin properties. Twin properties are a digital twin, effectively. So they come in two types, desired and reported. Desired properties, you can think of those kind of like .NET configuration files. So we're all familiar with the app.config that sits in the root of our web applications, that kind of thing. With a twin desired property, we desire that our device has this runtime information. Now, it is essentially just another type of message that gets sent from the cloud to the device, exactly the same as the telemetry messages, but it has an altogether more useful purpose in configuring the device. Typically what you would use your desired properties for, you would keep a list of runtime parameters, maybe in a database, maybe in your back-end application, and then when your application, when your device starts up, it can make a request to MQTT and say, hey, send me my properties. And those properties then come down to it. Where do you send your reports? How, how, what frequency of those reports are, what kind of data are you sending, anything you desire. The reported properties are the opposite of the desired properties. Again, just like the cloud to device, the device to cloud messaging. With reported properties, these, think of these like radio signal strength, things that you want to keep an eye on. Reported properties and things around the reported property framework do not come out of the regular telemetry output. So if you've got an event on your IoT hub that goes to an Azure function and you do a reported property update, that reported property is not sent to your Azure function. It stops at IoT Hub. What you then have to do is your backend application is responsible for keeping an eye on those problems. Yeah? 
you can, in other elements of IoT Hub, aside from the events, you can keep an eye on them and you can send your report properties directly to things like Power BI for different dashboards, for reporting things like that. So if you had temperature critical devices that were deployed, you could have a dashboard that watched the temperatures on all the devices. Um, radio signal strength, that kind of thing. And then perhaps even use something like ML to predict which devices are about to drop off the network or lose the signal or go bang or something like that. Some deployments use the reported functionality in order to report back to the back-end application to say, yes, I've received the desired properties that you gave me. In fact, that is actually one of Microsoft's recommended strategies for the desired report property cycle. Um, again, you don't have to, they don't have to be responded to, but if you wanted to, there are methods and classes built in to allow you to easily do that. Finally, we have direct commands. Direct commands, exactly as my slides say, are much like IPC. Um, I'm sure there's some of you in here who are familiar with using the dreaded SOAP protocol. Yes. Yes? <laughs> Just thank yourself lucky that you don't still have nightmares about it, because I know some people do. SOAP, in its heyday, was actually really good. It was a way of saying, there's a web service, and it exposes named functions. And I can call a named function, and it will just work. There was none of this having to assemble a block of JSON that exactly matched what needed to match, and calling various different endpoints to get metadata and do this and do that and do the other. You basically just went, that's the name, that's the parameters, bang, give me the result. Unfortunately, SOAP got so heavily abused that it became the stuff of nightmares and very quickly fell out of favour. Hopefully, direct commands will not end up like that, but direct commands work in a very, very similar way. Now, I said before, the reason I was making a point that the other things don't have to be responded to is because direct commands are the exception to the rule. If your device implements the direct command structure, and you send it direct commands either from the Azure IoT Hub or from your back-end application, you have to respond to them. .NET Nano Framework's implementation of the Azure SDK handles that for you. You don't need to worry about it. If, however, you're using something like the C or the C++ SDK, particularly the C++ for limited devices, which is very painful, we'll leave it at that, you have to do so much of this plumbing yourself manually that it's scary. But the SDK does at least help you a little bit. Since we're doing nano, we'll leave that behind. We don't need to worry about that. So by now, I don't think I need to actually go through that. The .NET Nano framework has first class support for everything that I've just gone through on these slides and will now hopefully see if the demo gods are going to love us. The reason I'm a little bit sceptical is because there is currently a bug in the .NET Nano framework. Um, I've been talking with Jose and the other guys that created it earlier today. Um, it is something that the thought had fixed hasn't quite been fixed. I know that the demo that I've got running on that is actually failed because I just tested it before there. Peter will bear witness. Um, so I do know of a way to work around it. I'm hoping that it's going to honour me and work around the way I've been working around it sort of for the past week while I've been working with this presentation. If it doesn't, I'll still walk you through the code. I just won't be able to single step and explain to you what's going on along the way. Right. So, no, we don't want that. Okay.
One of the first things you're going to want, can you all see that okay, by the way? Can yeah? You Sorry, see you? Can you zoom in? Um, I can try and take... I can try and take the font size up a bit. But the problem is I'm using a touchpad and... Use the zoom on the bottom left. Knock it up to 150 or something. That's right, it's down here somewhere, isn't it? On the other side. On the other left. side, yeah. yeah. That's the thing. Um, for my sins, I usually use the JetBrains tools these days. <laughs> so, <laughs> I apologise if I'm fidgeting around looking for settings. Too big? That's perfect. <laughs> yeah, wait till I bring the output console up. I haven't got a clue how to resize that one. Um, right, just ignore the code for a moment. Um, because we'll come back to that in a minute. One of the first things that you're going to want to install in your copy of Visual Studio is the .NET Nano extension. Um, in case you're wondering about the funky new extension manager, it's because I'm using the preview version. So this hasn't actually been released yet. But you'll see right there, I've got .NET Nano framework. And, oh, that's actually been updated since last night. Last night that was shown as a preview version. So they've, uh, they've released 3.067 as the current release. Um, Basically, just go into your extension manager, search for Nano, do the usual click install, yes, restart, let Visix do its thing, go back in. Once you have the extension installed, it will provide you with a number of templates. Now, I'm not going to go and create a whole new project because I don't want to unload the project that I have working. And... I really should have brought my actual mouse instead of using the touchpad, but never mind. But once you go into create new project, it's as simple as searching for nano. Oh, it should be. Oh, there we go. I don't quite know why it took that long, but there we go. Um, most of the time, you're going to want a blank application. Um, blank application. How many of you in here have done WinForms development? Excellent. Do you like the fact that you can do WinForms development in one main code module and not have to do the class and the entry point main and all that lot? Yes? Well, .NET Nano straight away. Yeah? One file, you can put everything in program.cs, there's no main, there's no program. You can do it that way if you want, but the whole minimal boilerplate standards that you're used to with ASP.NET, the .NET Nano guys have supported it. Um, you can do class libraries and unit test projects. I'm not going to show either of them too. Um, I do know that Jose, uh, Jose Simone, one of the lead guys who developed this, actually did a class library for a previous demo that myself and he did for .NET Nuts where we actually showed how to take a Lego NXT system, butcher it, put C Sharp onto a couple of ESP32s and then use that to control Lego robots built with a Mindstorms kit. And he showed how to use the class library to actually make your own I2C slave devices and sensors that not only worked with what we were doing but could be plugged back into Lego NXT to build your own sensors for the Lego NXT system as well. So, if you're curious about how complex this stuff can get, go and find that video, and it was about December last year, something like that, and have a look at Jose's part on that. I guarantee it will make your hair curl. <laughs> it frightened me away, and I've been doing this for 30 years, so there you go. Anyway, blank application is typically what you're going to want. I'm not going to next that, but it is the familiar Visual Studio experience, next, pick your options, next, provide your name, your folder, next, blah, project created, boom, job done. 
Once you have the extension, you will get this panel here. Um, I can actually do this, can't I? Yes, I can. So you'll get this panel here called the Device Explorer. Now, obviously, I've got mine docked in with the normal sort of solution explorer. Um, if you're using Visual Studio, Visual Studio 2019 for this, there is a bug. It's not .NET Nano Team's fault, it's Microsoft. It's something to do with the drawing of these icons across here. Thankfully, this seems to be working in 2022, so I'm not having a problem here. But what you might find is in 2019, these icons start disappearing and such like. You'll see also that I have an ESP32 revision zero on COM6 there. And just like you might do with any other device, if you go into the system device manager, you will find that under your COM ports. So right there, Silicon Labs. Now you may, depending on the type of serial adapter that your device has, you may need a driver for it, okay? On some devices, particularly the larger STM32 products, such as the Blackboards, the Discoveries, they don't have serial on the USB. So you may have to have um, everybody, are you familiar with those small FTDI UART adapters, anybody? No? So you can get a little adapter called an FTDI, which is basically a USB serial to TTL. And it will typically have some pins on the back, a USB on the front, you plug it in, it'll show up as something like a Silicon Labs or a Future Technology Devices or a something similar, but it will give you a COM port and then you'll attach the wires to the back of it and attach them to the UART on your dev board um, the right way around RX to TX, TX to RX, that kind of thing. Just as if you, you were hooking up a normal serial cable. Um, .NET Nano supports all of that. Typically, to get it to appear in Device Explorer, it has to appear as a serial port. Programming them, that's a different kettle of fish altogether. We'll come back to that in a minute. Once you have a device with the firmware on, and you run the search algorithm here. So if I bring up the output and do a search, and it's going to vanish it, isn't it, yeah? not going to it's not going to do it for me no there's a surprise that was it no okay uh, hang on. Maybe. okay it's not going to do it for me but what you should have seen in the output window there is it'll go through all the com ports in your system it will check them with a the magic signature and those that respond and say I'm a nano device will appear at the side. The one thing you have to remember before you hit that magic run button there is you need to select the device you want to work with. Yeah? If I unhighlight that, it won't tell me, it won't say, hey, you need to have a device selected. What it'll do is it'll go, hey, I can't deploy this, there's something broken. It's, it's error code 15 or whatever it is, you know? And it won't actually tell you that you haven't got a device selected. The most common problem I and the other guys see in the .NET Nano forums is, why can't I deploy my device? Why can't I deploy my code to my device? It keeps telling me that it can't deploy, why? And that is most likely the cause. There are a couple of others, I'll cover those in a second. But before we go any further, you need to flash the device. Um, so you can see there that I've installed the Nano 2. Do I need to increase that a bit or is that okay? Well, we'll increase it a little bit. 
Uh, I should probably have looked at doing this before I uh, sat down. There we go. Uh, well, where are we? So you can see that I've installed the .NET Nano tool, just as my slide said. .NET tool install dash G nano. You want the dash G because that makes it global, it puts it in the path, and it makes sure that you can run it from anywhere. Because typically, you're going to be working from your project folder. So if you have your project open in Visual Studio and you've got the developer command prompt up, you're just going to be typing nanoth, and if it's not dash G, it's going to tell you that it can't find it. Once you have nanoth installed, as, my, as again with my slide, you can see here that I've said update. Um, I'm not going to do an update because it'll take three or four minutes and you'll just be looking at the screen doing nothing because there's not really much output. It prints something, then you sit twiddling your thumbs, then it prints something, you twiddle your thumbs and then it says I'm done. So there's no nice update bars or anything. Um, what you may want to uh, remember is not to copy and paste from PowerPoint slides when you're testing to make sure all this is working and then wondering why the hell it's not working when it was 10 minutes ago. And again, that's because, as I mentioned, PowerPoint put the two dashes together. So, of course, you can see here, option P, option S, option U is unknown. But you can also see that, just like any tool, it will give you the basic information. Now, you'll notice here that there's mention of JTAG drivers and things like that. A lot of the STM32 boards require the use of their own specialist programmers to flash them. You can't just flash them from a serial port. Those devices are things like the ST-Link, the ST-Link V2, and typically things like the discovery boards will have the flasher built into them as a separate board that's joined on to the main PCB. If you're using one of those boards and you're looking to set your firmware up, you're going to want to use the list JTAG stuff so that it tells you the serial numbers of things like your programmers. Once you've got an ST-Link programmer installed, for example, it'll give you a rather long 16-digit number and that 16-digit number will be the device ID that you want to use to program it. Fortunately, ESP32 is a simple. It's a COM port, so that Nanoff platform ESP32 serial port update will do the trick. Once you have the device programming, this is basically what you'll see. So you can see there, I've got it correct that time, I'll put the double dashes in, and it reads the details from the chip, it tells you exactly what this is. So this particular one here is a 240 megahertz, um, Wi-Fi, dual core, Bluetooth, that kind of thing. On. Other, others, it will tell you the specifications, flash size, things like that. Quite often, with the more common boards, if you don't have enough memory, you don't have enough RAM, it will also tell you that. And in many cases, it will give you a warning and say, look, I'm not going to stop you doing something stupid. You're welcome to try it. Just be aware that it may not work because you don't have enough memory on the board. Particularly if you have a board that's not officially supported, i.e. there's not an official platform or a community support platform, it will let you pick the nearest platform to the one that you have. So, for example, I have an STM32 Blackboard at home, which is an F407 processor. The nearest that we have officially is an F411 processor. Unfortunately, the pin layout is slightly different. The UARTs, the LEDs, the built-in peripherals are on slightly different pins, so it doesn't quite work for me. But when I was testing to see if I could, it was happy to let me flash that firmware onto that board 
because it may have worked. So if you're trying this for the first time, and particularly if you're dealing with the STM32, don't be afraid to try different firmware images. You're not going to blow your device up, you know? And I've never seen anybody brick one yet. Because generally, if you put the wrong firmware on, it just won't show up in Visual Studio, so you can go back to Nanoff, you can try another firmware. And because it's only a firmware, if you find that it doesn't run Nanoff, you can then go and plug it straight back into something like the STM32 tools, or IAR Workbench, or some other thing, and continue doing C, C++, and other development on it. So you're not going to kill your device by picking the wrong, the, the, the wrong firmware. In this case, pay attention to the fact that I've got 1.9.1.0 on here. This is important. Firmwares are matched to NuGet package versions. So if you put the latest Nanoff firmware on your device, the first thing you need to do is to go straight into, where the hell is my Solution Explorer? Uh, there it is. Um, the first thing you're going to need to do is to go straight into here, and you manage new get packages and update your packages to the latest versions. Now, you can see that I don't have any upgrade arrows on mine because I made sure all that lot was upgraded last night. But if you get any upgrade arrows on here and you do decide to update your, your nanos, your, your, sorry, your new get packages, but you don't upgrade using the nano flashing tool, you very likely will get a deployment error along the lines of we have MS Core Lib blah dot blah dot blah you need ms call lib blah dot blah dot blah okay if you see anything like that it won't necessarily be ms call lib but you will recognize the dll names because it's all the same dll names that you get in regular.net you will see mismatches that generally means either that's out of date or your firmware's out of date and believe me Obev Fabergé, or whatever his name is, is very, very intolerant in the Discord group of people asking that question. I probably would be too if I got it asked of me 11 million times a day, but he gets quite short-tempered when you go in the Discord group and go, got a package mismatch, what do I do? He'll go, you know what to do. <laughs> um, he is a good guy, he just gets a bit fed up with the same questions over and over again. And that brings us, eventually, to the actual code itself. Now, bar the fact that I have changed some small bits and pieces here, um, like text, things like that in the strings that responded from the application, this is the stock basic as you were sample, okay? I'm showing you this because obviously I'm covering Azure IoT as well, but don't be scared off um, because if you go to GitHub, I will just, um, I'll show you the samples. There are samples for everything. Not just as you or I or team, but if all you want to do is program your device and make it control the washing machine or your TV or do some daft thing with IO, then you've got all of this lot to choose from. Like I said, the documentation is spectacular, the examples are even more spectacular. Um, if you're wondering what the chilies are, the little chili symbols are the difficulty scale. So the hotter a project is, the harder it's likely to be, and the more likely it is going to need specialist knowledge, things like that. But as you can see, there's no shortage of stuff to learn from. If you're gonna play with this stuff, bookmark that, clone the entire thing, and just try running stuff. It's great fun. Um, 
one thing I'll say about the French guys and the Portuguese guys that are working on this, they have a wicked sense of humour. So you'll find some very interesting buried error messages and responses and things that the device will pop up in the console when you run some of these. Um, right, now I'm going to look like a chump here because I'm going to run this as is. I don't expect this to actually work. This is going to hit the bug that I mentioned earlier. In fact, I'm pretty sure it is. But it'll give you a flavour of deploying it. Then I'm going to go and change something in IoT Hub and hopefully it will run properly after that. So you can see there, um, the DLL names that are the same. And it's, for all wants and purposes, it is the same as just running a normal C Sharp application. Let's just shrink that down a bit. I can F10 through it. I can F11. Um, yes, it is a go-to before anybody says anything. I didn't write it. You can F11. So you can see there, there's the Wi-Fi network helper. If success, yep, there we go. So straight away. One of the useful things, by the way, that the guys have built into some of these calls, here, for example, this Connect DHCP also requires date, time, true. You can set that to false, but if you set it to true, as well as going and getting a DHCP and connecting you onto the network automatically, it will go and it will do a network time protocol request as well. The reason they've built that in, and you don't have to do it separately, is because a lot of the MQTT stuff and the application tokens that you use need an accurate date and time, needs to be correct. We're all familiar with trying to do HTTPS when the system clock's wrong, right? It tells you to bugger off or the, the device certificate or the, the website certificate's not right and you're left scratching your head thinking, what? Yeah, it's exactly the same here. So little things like that, they've took and they've combined them in to higher level functions, yeah? So that you don't have to do the extra work yourself. So we'll continue F10ing out of there. Now, come back to this in a minute because I will go through this again. Like I said, I'm just stepping through this right now because I don't actually expect this one to work. But I want to try it before I switch over to Azure IoT because in order to make it work, I have to make some changes in Azure. So. Yep, there we go. So that one's fallen over. Okay. So if we go to here, straight away you'll see that this looks very much like what Dan was showing you before. Um, again, thanks to Dan, I don't have to explain very much of this. But if I go to the overview, oh, I'm on the overview, sorry, this, yeah, this is my resource group. So if you remember what Dan told you about resource groups, this resource group is holding, I have two IoT hubs in here. Um, you can see that I have all my alerts, my monitoring, my metrics, all the kind of thing that Dan was telling me about down the side. So everything that he mentioned, I can do with an IoT hub, that kind of thing. If I go into my IoT hub, now this is a standard IoT hub. Um, standard, basic and free, you get a daily message quarter of 400,000 messages. Those messages are the device to cloud messages and the cloud to device message channel that I mentioned back when I had the slides up. Other things will typically use up maybe two or three of those messages. Um, you can see there, for example, today I've already used 612 messages. Once you go over your 400,000 quarter, you will start getting charged per message 
for the messages that you send. I don't know what the price is. I think it depends on the tier. I don't deal with pricing on this. It's my client's account. I've just been given permission to use it to show you what these tools look like. But you do get lots of pretty graphs that tell you what failed, what didn't fail, how many devices connected, how many devices didn't connect, that kind of thing. And as I mentioned before, you can hook events up to these things. So if we go to the event tab, I can take anything that that device spits out. Basically, these devices from this event will split, spit out one of five different things. They'll spit out the telemetry message, which are the things that you send from your device to cloud channel. They will spit out a connected, disconnected message. So when that is switched on, plugged in, and it logs into Azure, that message will be emitted when it's disconnected, not forcibly, but via software by saying Azure disconnect, disconnection will be emitted. Also, there's two others, created, deleted. So if your backend application creates a new device within your hub, created will be emitted. If your backend or somebody from the Azure IoT portal deletes a device from your hub, deleted message will be emitted. Any of those five messages that come through that events channel can go to any of those these any of these things here. So you can connect it to a logic app, a Azure function, your own webhook. It doesn't have to be an Azure webhook. So you can have your own HTTP thing running on Azure or anywhere uh, on AWS, Linode, anything like that, and you can send it there. Storage queues, event hubs, service bus event grid, all sorts of things. And then from there, you can send them onwards and upwards to other elements in your solution. Um, you can also configure things like endpoints and message routing. So you can say, for example, you can look at a device name. If you name your devices in such a way as the identifiers on those devices make it clear that one might be a temperature controller, one might be a motor controller, you can set up rules in the message routing and built in endpoints to say if it has this name, send it to this webhook, if it has this name, send it to this webhook. So you don't need to build any of this logic into your Azure application. You can have Azure handle that for you. And you can literally have different teams developing different applications, and one person is sitting making the rules of where the traffic goes. Simple as that. Um, things like logging is available, metrics is available, all the kind of stuff. Um, I don't think application insights is available, but if you've got an endpoint such as a Mizzou function or a web job or something like that, then obviously you can trace all of this with the endpoint stuff as well. The place where you're going to spend most of your time in, a two, in IoT Hub, however, is here in the devices panel. Now you can see right here, I have two devices. Okay, that the second device exists because the bug cropped up earlier on. So my demo originally had the first device. I had to create a second device. So what I'm going to try and do is create a third device. So we're just going to call this one the third device. Now, when you create a device, you're going to want to have symmetric key selected. Symmetric key basically allows you to take this thing that looks very much like an API token whack it into your source code, and it's just going to run. You can, if you want to, do the whole X509 self-signed certificate chain, or if you've got one, say, from Let's Encrypt, or Baltimore, or some other certificate authority, you can use that. That starts getting a bit complicated. The .NET Nano SDK does support you doing that, but you've got to be careful about what certificates you use, because Microsoft trusts some, it doesn't trust others. There are different levels, and your mileage may vary depending on which type you use. 
Symmetric keys, on the other hand, will nearly always work. Symmetric keys also work in a similar way to JSON web tokens. The Nano SDK will have a timeout on it, which is configurable. I think the default's about 60 minutes. And every 60 minutes, it will send a request to Azure IoT Hub. That'll say you're disconnected. It'll give me a new key. There's my symmetric key. Boom, boom, boom. Do all the hashing functions. Reconnect for another 60 minutes. Okay? So with symmetric keys, it's largely self-sufficient and it looks after its own thing. Right. We'll save that. So we now see that in here we have the third device. So we're just going to grab that name and we're going to go back here. We're going to drop that in there. Then we're going to go back here. Now you have two sets of keys and connection strings. The connection string is basically just your device ID, the hub name, in this case, Nano Framework Hub, and your device's symmetric key in a convenient connection string. Connection strings are used primarily in places in a similar manner to how you would use things like an SQL Server connection string. Your back-end applications, for example, if you're using the Azure Devices Control SDK, will use the connection string. I'm not covering that here today because that's a whole topic in itself. For the devices themselves and .NET Nano, you're typically going to want the primary key and the secondary key. And the reason you have two keys is basically if you follow Microsoft's guidelines for managing IoT devices in IoT Hub, they recommend that you regenerate your keys on a frequent basis. And they provide a primary and a secondary because the idea is that you deploy your device with the secondary key while you recycle the first key, then you switch it back to your first key and you recycle the second key. And this means that you can change keys for a whole batch of devices with nothing more than a reboot for each key. And if you're smart and you do it properly using the desired and the reported properties, you can use the property in the digital twins infrastructure to send your new key out, have the device consume that key, save it in flash storage, reboot, log on with that new key, and then once all your devices have completed that logon, you can change your entire key your entire key surface for all your devices without losing any down, well, without incurring any downtime, basically. Again, there's no necessity to do that. That's just Microsoft's guidance. That's why they provide that. In this case, all I want is to copy that key. And we replace this field here. There's my mouse pointer. And of course, it's going to try and delimit it, isn't it? Um, you'll see that the SSID and the password is for the Wi-Fi in here because it goes without saying, all of this stuff is connected, so it needs to be online. You need to have an active connection. If you don't, then none of it's going to work. And also, if you look at the IoT broker address, Nano Framework Hub is the name of the hub that I'm using. So if we just skip back to here, you can see there, Nano Framework Hub. All Framework Hubs are created with a URL. Again, similar to what Dan explained to you before for some of the resources he was using. IoT Hub is no exception. When you create an IoT Hub, it will only give you that name. But when you're specifying in code, it's nanoframework.azuredevices.net. Yep. Okay, so with any luck, if this bug doesn't bite me straight away, and it shouldn't do, because technically this is now a new device, this should single step through and create and connect.
So you can see there, just down at the bottom, that it's deploying. Again, we've seen this before, so there we go. Um, the left hand down, the left hand, left hand. I'm not going to go into that with an F11. Right, so as we are initialising this code, so you should now understand what some of these event handlers are for. Yeah, your twin updated event handler is your twin desired properties. So if I go into IoT Hub and I make a change to the desired properties, that event handler will get fired. Status updated, that is typically the IoT status. So if you get disconnected, you'll get status updates saying you've been disconnected. If you're switched to a different connection, because sometimes you might go from MQTT to AMQP automatically, um, that's not because you're doing something wrong, it's because sometimes if there's congestion on the network, Microsoft will switch you across to a different protocol. You don't typically need to worry about that because that's all automatic. The whole pub sub thing all works exactly the same. Your cloud to device message, so that is your Azure hub messages sent down to your device. Yeah? The hello world thing that was on about your reverse telemetry. And it's just regular event handlers, you'll see them in a minute. And then we've got our direct commands. And this is why the direct command structures in IoT Hub really is very, very good. Because you can see here that there's nothing special about this. I am taking make addition, raise exception callback, method callback test. These are methods in this code. Yeah? They're not function pointers or anything stupid like that. They're not action, generic actions or anything sly. They are methods. If you have that method defined and it has a proper signature, you can say add method callback and when a direct command with that method name is received by the SDK, it will call that method. End of story. No passing, no nothing. And if you pass parameters into it in the form of a JSON structure, it will also put those parameters in a hash table for you. Nice and easy. So you can just go, I'll have that, I'll have that, I'll do something with them, and I'll return a result. Yeah? So if you're building a device that needs to control something, I would say use the direct commands rather than use the messaging structures. Use the messaging structures for mainly for the purpose that they're used for, which is more or less status, that kind of thing. How long, how long do you think you'll be in now? Five, ten Five minutes. minutes. Yeah. Um, fingers crossed. Yes. So there we go. Like I said, there's a bug, and if you uh, if you treat it nicely, it connects. So here we're getting the get twin. So that's going to get your desired properties. So basically at startup, if you do a get twin, any desired properties that are set on the digital twin, which are set in here in the device twin, it will pick them up. So under your desired there, you just put in my property. some data and then save that. I'm not going to save it just yet, I'll save it in a minute. Anything that exists in there already, get twin will pull it in and you'll get a JSON structure for it. You can do whatever you like with that JSON structure. You can deserialize it into a static model, you can put it into a hash table, anything you like. It's just JSON. Um, you shouldn't get a twin that is null because there's always going to be something in there. There is metadata that is provided by the framework itself. Digital twins are actually version controlled. You will get a version number with them and when you get updates it will tell you how many things have been updated. And it will tell you which of the properties have the different versions in as well. So if you've got four properties and you add a fifth one and you're on version five, those four properties will stay on five but the new property will have a version of one. 
but the overall global version will remain at five. Things like that. So you can not only version your desired properties, but you can version the individual ones as well between different devices. Um, yeah, so there's not really anything in there because I haven't saved that yet. Twin collection, these are your reported properties. So again, I'll create twin collection and now I'll add a firmware and we'll add an SDK. Again, anything you like, it's just an object. You can have, there's no rules, you can call them anything you want, you can give them any value you want. They, when you do the update reported, will get pushed to the device. So you can see that's there, no, I haven't updated that yet. That, you'll see that in a minute once I save this and it gets updated. And then I'm just going into a loop here. Nothing special. So in my loop, as you were, send message, send message as your device to message channel. Yeah, again, whatever the hell you want. Serialize it, whichever way you want. B64 encoded binary, if you need it to be binary, job done. Otherwise, wait for 20 seconds or complain if not. So I'm just going to let this run here. If you want to monitor your telemetry, don't worry folks, I'm nearly done. If you want to monitor your telemetry, you need to open and request a cloud shell. There are tools out there that mean you don't have to do it this way, but this is the quickest way to do it. And you basically just do AZ IoT hub monitor events and the name of your hub. Now this is sending its telemetry every 20 seconds. There you go. And you can see that that payload is exactly what was being sent just there. Yep. It's static data in this case, it's just a demo, but that could be being read from a temperature sensor, it could be being read from anything that that board is physically capable of, able of communicating with. Control C, exit, we're done with that. If I save that, my property, some data. Don't you need missing a comma at the end of 19? Yes, well spotted Peter. See, somebody has to keep me right. <laughs> Otherwise I'll just babble on like an idiot. I told you I was a Geordie idiot at the beginning. <laughs> we save that. If we go back to Visual Studio, we'll see there. You can just see we've got the twin update receive at the bottom there. And it told me how many properties have changed. And then I've just got the status update changed five there. And again, it sent another telemetry. But you will also see that if I look in my reported properties, I also have those two properties that my firmware sent. Yeah? So I can send them on just as regular scale as I can send my device to cloud messages if I want to. That's not the idea, but you can use them that way if you need to. Just remember your reported properties don't get emitted on your event. So if you're hooking this up to a webhook, reported will not go through that webhook. Reported go into IoT Hub, they stay in IoT Hub. To read them, you physically have to read the digital twin. And as for messages, well, the device to cloud message, we'll do that one quickly. I don't really think I need to say much about that. Send message. Remember, this doesn't have to be acknowledged. It's fire and forget. But there you go. Message arrived. Hello world. Text plane. It can be JSON if I want it to. It can be binary encoded base 64. But if you want to send JSON with a regular message, you can use the key value property. 
I'm not going to actually demo that, but you recall Dan showed you how tags and things work. That's exactly the same. If I put a key and a value in there and I send it, that will accompany the message. And last but not least, our direct command. So we go back into here, we'll say direct method. As I explained earlier on, the nano framework handles this for you. If you're using the C++ one, you will probably have to do your own reply. Let's just find it. There we go, method call back test. So I'm going to deliberately make an error here because if you notice that is spelt method call back test. But I'm going to spell it properly to show you what happens. If I invoke that message, you'll see I had a response timeout of 30 seconds selected at the bottom. Your response timeout is whatever you select plus 15 for the overhead of the HTTP call. So this will wait about 45 seconds. And if the device does not respond, because it's switched off, for example, or it doesn't recognize it, or it doesn't have a method called that, Hurry up, please. <laughs> it will do that. Yep. Request failed with a status code of 504. Technically, it's an exception, but this is an exception generated by Azure, not by the device. This is important, as you'll see in a minute. The methods that we have available You'll see I also have a race exception callback test. Um, sorry, I actually meant to call this correctly first, didn't I? If I spell that correctly, it'll just go and event it bump straight back like that. Yeah? You have to respond. You have to return from your methods. You can't have void methods as direct commands. Even if you just return an empty date JSON string, you have to return something. Um, Exceptions, you can throw exceptions. Now, obviously, I'm running in the Visual Studio dev environment. So that looks like it's failed, but in actual fact, it hasn't. There you go. If this was running outside the dev environment, that would just quietly do nothing. You'd get your 504 back. In this case, you're getting a return back you won't get an exception thrown on your code running on the server. So if you're using back-end code to control this, you won't get an exception, but you'll get a status 504 back. 504 means the device did something stupid. 200 means the device did something good. If you're controlling the return codes yourself, you can use anything you want. So in actual fact, um, in one of the devices that I'm doing for one of my clients, what I actually do is I send a 404 back when an invalid method name is sent in. Some of you may be sitting there thinking, well, those status codes are web codes, and you're, you'd be exactly right. Those codes follow the same pattern as anything you might in the HTTP world. So 200 OK, 404 not found, 403 authentication required, that kind of thing. Use the same ones, Microsoft have set some standards. And last but not least for direct commands, as I mentioned, any payload you send to it, it comes to you in a dead simple hash table. So if I go back here, we put that in, and then in my payload I go One. Yes, you will quickly find once you use Azure up IoT up that it is a pain in the ass for formatting things for you. But there you go. Twenty plus ten, as we know, is going to be thirty. Invoke the method, comes back with the result. And you can see by looking through that, that's exactly what you would expect it to. If you don't send it the arguments and it tries to pull that variables out, you'll get an exception. 
but as you've seen that comes back as a 504 it won't crash your device yeah some exceptions will things like connecting to iot hub things like getting duff data in your digital twin will crash your device but things like your direct commands won't crash your device they won't leave it there in a zombie state where it needs rebooted or anything like that because all of that stuff's handled for you and that's largely it so i actually have a command implemented in here which i put in as a standard message whereby i can tell the device to stop and there we go message arrives stopped that's actually just gone into an infinite loop now where it's doing nothing it's disconnected from iot hub and i can kill it and yes it had to do that didn't it so there you go if you've got questions you know where to find me there's not many of you left but if Cassim allows you to, you can ask me anything you want to now. Otherwise, just come and hunt me down and I'll do what you do.